Good evening, and welcome to my fire. Under a full moon, I plan to tell you five stories. Now, a lot of these stories have different names. And this first story, my version of it is called The Grave Digger's Wife. The Grave Digger's Wife was sitting in her rocking chair, her old tom cat in her lap, watching her husband's supper growing cold on the table. Well, Tom, she said to the cat, he's late again, and we know what that means. He stopped off at the inn for a drink or two, and here he said he swore an off drink. Well, it'll be the worst for him when he gets home. She was just lighting a candle against the dark when the door flung open. In came her husband, slamming it behind him, throwing his back up against it, saying, Who's Tom Tildrum and where can I find him? Well, the old cat jumped off his mistress's lap, ran over to the hearth of the fireplace and turned around and looked at that man trembling at the door. John, John, said his wife, whatever is the matter? Oh, Oh, that I should have seen what I've seen tonight. John, sit down, settle yourself. Tell me what is wrong. I, I thought I will, that I will. I, I was just finishing old Mr. Arbogast's grave. Oh, old Mr. Arbogast, has he left us? Well, no one's going to miss him. Uh, well, maybe not. But, uh, well, I, I just lit the lamp and I was squaring off the corners when... I thought I heard a funeral party coming. And I thought to myself, they're not bringing around old Mr. Arbogast now, not, not without a proper wake, are they? Well, I climbed to the top of my ladder and I, I looked over the edge of my grave. And, uh, the moon had risen and there was a fog coming up from the ground. But through it, I could see there was a funeral party coming, but it weren't right. It wasn't a priest leading. It was a figure in a black coat, a tall black hat, and a red sash, and he had a staff, and he was thumping it on the ground every other step, and the mourners behind were crying out every time he thumped the staff. And I could see the coffin was covered with a black drape, and on the top of it was a wee little crown. And I thought to myself, Lord, preserve me, it's the little people. Now, John said his wife, tell me the truth. Did you stop off at the inn for a drink? No, no, I, I've sworn off drink. Well, I should have run away just there and then, but uh, my feet, they were frozen to the ladder. I couldn't move. All I could do was watch them coming on and come they did. And as they got closer, uh, I could see that the pallbearers each had a silver collar. I could see the moon shining off of their sharp teeth, and their eyes glowed red. And as they came closer, I could see their hind legs were crooked. Oh no, it wasn't the little people at all. They were cats. Now, John. Tell me the truth. Just how many drinks did you have? None, none. Well, they came up level to me grave and stopped. And the one in front with the black coat and the tall hat, he turned on his paw. He came over to me and looked down into me grave and said, Tell Tom Tildrum that Tim Tildrum's dead. Turns back around, goes into line, thumps the staff, and off they go. Thump. Yo, thump, yo, thump, yo, thump, yo, and until they disappeared in the mist. Well, then my feet became unfrozen. I ran home here, and now I'm asking you, who's Tom Tilderman? Where can I find him? Well, the poor gravedigger's wife did not know what to think. He didn't sound drunk. He didn't smell drunk. But if he weren't drunk, he must be mad. But just then, the old Tom Cat, who'd been listening to this sitting on the hearth, rose up on his hind legs. 
his eyes glowing red, and said, Tim Tildrum's dead? Then I'm king of the cats. And he skittered up the chimney flue. Some ashes came down, and he was gone. Well, a gravedigger's wife warmed up her husband's supper for him. She went down into the basement and tapped out a pint of ale for him and a pint of ale for herself. And that was the last they ever saw of that old Tom cat again by the gravedigger or the gravedigger's wife. I like that story. It's uh, one of my favorites. I like to start my programs with it. Here's uh, another uh, favorite. Oh, I've been telling this story for a long time. It's of a motif called the cruel sister. Lord William came courting, the eldest daughter of the king. She was dark and beautiful, and he trothed to her his glove and ring, hoping that he would be king after. But his eyes fell favorably upon her younger sister, who was light and lovely. And this vexed the dark sister so, that her mind fell to an evil plan. Sister, she said, come with me down to the strand, and we'll go and watch our father's boats come in. Hand in hand they went down to the strand, and the youngest stood upon a rock and looked out across the water. But the dark sister came up from behind and pushed her into the river Benori. Sister, cried the younger, give me your hand and I will do your bidding, whatever it may be. You are doing my bidding already. Sister, she cried again, give me your hand and I will give you all that is mine and will be mine. It is mine already. Sister, she cried once more, give me your hand and I will turn sweet William's eyes from me. He has always been mine. And the dark sister turned her back on the river Benori. The younger sank and swam, sank and swam, sank and swam as the current carried her miles down the river. Presently, a, a miller's daughter came to the river bank to get a bucket of water. And she called out, Father, stop the mill wheel. Either a swan or a bonny maid comes down the mill race. Together they drug the princess from the water and laid her upon the bank. Oh, they had never seen anyone so lovely. Emeralds and rubies and pearls were woven into her golden hair. She wore a delicate white dress bound with a golden belt. Never had they seen anyone so lovely, especially in death. But they did not know who she had been. They called to a bard who happened to be passing near. Here was a man who had traveled the length and the breadth of the land, knew many people and many things. He recognized her at once, but saw in her a foul death. Bury her not. Rather put her upon a bier in a forest glen, and we shall see what comes to pass. And this they did with a heavy heart. They put her upon a bier in a forest glen, prayed for her immortal soul, and left her there. The bard traveled on, as was his wont, performing in the houses of lords and ladies, kings and queens. But in a year and a day he returned. By then thieves had come and stolen the emeralds, the rubies, and the pearls from her hair, carried off the golden belt. The white dress had turned to dust. All that was left were her bones and strands of her golden hair. He took her breastbone and carved it into the shape of a harp, as one might carve ivory, strung it with a golden hair, and used the finger bones as the pegs. This he carried 
to her father's castle and begged entrance that he would be that night's entertainment. Oh, he was gladly received, and after the evening meal, everyone brought their chairs and put them in a semicircle around the hearth of the fireplace, and the bard sat in front of them and set down the princess harp beside him, picked up his usual harp, and began to sing the old songs and the old stories, the stories of Beowulf and Grindel of Cahullin and Knights of the Red Branch, Finn McCool and the Finian Warriors. Oh, he sang the happy songs, the sad songs, the old songs, the new songs. But as he performed, night crept into the corners of the room. The servants were just lighting the candles when the prince's harp began to play all of its own. The bard put down his regular harp and looked across his company at their alarmed faces. Then he saw that the dark sister grew pale. Her knuckles turned red as she gripped the arms of her chair. She recognized the lilt of her sister's voice in the music of the harp. And then the harp began to sing. Yonder sits my father the king, Benori, oh Benori, and on his finger his signet ring by the bonny banks of Benori. And yonder sits an empty chair, Benori, oh Benori, it was I who once sat there by the bonny banks of Benori. And there be my William, proud and free, Benori, O oh Benori, and with him my sister, who killed me, by the bonny banks of Benori. The string snapped, the harp broke, and played no more. That story is also called Benori. I need to preface this next story with an explanation of the word worm. Uh, the word worm comes up in the story, and it's not the earthworm that crawls across the cement when it rains and we put onto fush fishing hooks. Uh, no, this is a dragon. Worm is the medieval word for dragon. And this story is called the Loathsome Worm of Bamborough Castle. The king was out hunting, and he and his mount had outrun all of his other men and their horses in pursuit of a white doe. Deeper and deeper into a dark forest they raced, but never could the king get a clear shot. There's always a tree or bramble or a standing stone in the way. But then he saw up ahead there was a clearing. He knew then he would get a good shot at the doe. And when they broke out into the open, the doe had disappeared. Disappointed, confused, the king turned his horse around and started to go back the way he had come. But in a little while, he found himself back at that same glen. It made him uneasy. There were no birds singing, no wind blowing through the branches. It was deadly silent. Well, he turned his horse around again, and paid a little more attention to where he was going, but he ended up back at that same glen. But now... An old woman was coming across it towards him. He knew she was a witch. Good day, madam. Do you know the way out of this glen? I, she said, that I do. But you, sir, do not. Nor will you find your way out until you do my bidding. I see, said the king. What is it you would have me do? My lord, 
Your kingdom is without a queen. And this was true. His wife had died a number of years ago and had left him with a son and a daughter. And the son's name was Childwin. And he had gone off adventuring to become a king in his own right. And his daughter, Margaret, helped him rule the kingdom. My lord, she said, I have a daughter who is worthy to be your queen. I see, said the king. Well, show her to me. And he followed the witch across the glen back to a rude cottage. The doorway was so low he had to bow in order to get inside. And inside, waiting for him, was a lovely woman dressed in riding clothes. Oh, she was beautiful. Hair as dark as night, skin as white as snow. But the sight of her sent a chill down the king's back. But before long, she was sitting in the saddle in front of him, showing him the way out of the glen. Well, when the king's men found the king and his quarry, they were quite surprised. They sent word back to the castle that the king returned with a bride. Margaret was a bit alarmed. She didn't know that her father was seeking a bride. But she did not question his decisions. When the hunting party came into the courtyard, she came down from the hall, carrying a ring of keys, calling out, Welcome, father, to your house and bower, and welcome, my new mother. All you see about you is yours to command, and proffered her the keys. The young witch looked about at the people gathered in the courtyard and saw that they were looking at Margaret and not at her. She took the keys with no word of thanks. The next day there was a royal wedding. And afterwards, a royal wedding feast that lasted for three days. But at the end of it, the king fell ill. And though he was nursed by his new bride, in a week he died. Now there was a royal funeral. And afterwards, Margaret retired to her rooms to grieve in private. And the witch queen retired to the dungeons, where she cast a spell. Nine times nine she passed round. Three times three she uttered a spell. Now every witch and warlock knows that for every spell, there's a curse and a benefit. The benefit usually having to do with the breaking of the spell. And it is the talent of every witch and warlock to make that so hard to achieve, it is nearly impossible. Nine times nine she passed round, and three times three she uttered this spell. I wish she were a loathsome worm, and never more Margaret be, until Child Wayne, the king's own son, gives her kisses three. The next morning, Margaret's ladies-in-waiting came to help her bathe and dress. And there, lying across her bed and crushing it, was a dragon, slaver drooling from its lips. The women went screaming out of the chamber, and the worm came slithering behind them down the hall, out of the castle, and made for the rock atop of Spindleton Hugh. And on top of that hill it curled itself around the rock and looked out across the countryside. And from there it ventured out, eating the cattle of the peasants. The peasants did not know what to do. It was the queen's worm. She would not help them. They gathered what coins they could and went to a warlock and asked him for advice. He read through his dusty tombs, he conferred with his familiars, 
he cast the runes. And then he said, Take the milk of nine cows and put it in the stone trough at the foot of Spindleton Hill, and it will content itself with that. Then send word to Childlin of what has happened. And this they did. Every day they took the milk of nine cows and put it in the stone trough at the foot of Spindleton Hugh. And the worm would slither down the hill, lap up the milk, and did not bother with the cattle. And then they sent word to Childwin. And the word went east, and the word went west, and the word went over the sea. And when it came to the ears of Childwin, what he heard was this that his father had died, his sister consumed by a dragon, and a witch queen sat on the throne. He swore vengeance, and three and thirty of his men swore allegiance to him, and he caused a boat to be built. He supervised the building of the boat and made sure that the keel was made of rowan wood. And when the boat was finished, they hung their shields on the gunwales and rowed for the keep at Bamborough Castle. It was a three days journey. And before they came into sight of land, the witch queen sensed their coming. And she sent out her witch wives to bore a hole in the hull of the boat or, or raise a wind to capsize it. But because of the rowan wood keel, they could do it no harm. And when the boat came in sight of land, the witch queen sent out her worm. It uncurled itself from the rock at Spindleton Hugh, slithered down to the bay and swam out to sea, pushing Childwind's boat away. Because of the rowan wood keel, it could do it no harm, but it could stop the boat from landing. All day long, Childwin tried to get around the serpent, but he could not. And as it came towards night, he turned the boat around and rowed away. The witch queen was jubilant. She thought she had defeated him, but he only waited for the moon to set. And he turned around again and made for a secret bay he knew of. And when he landed, when his foot touched the soil, the witch queen's powers began to wane. Before sunrise, he came to the rock at Spindleton Hoo, and there lay the serpent near death. He unsheathed his sword and approached it. The worm raised its head and spoke. Put up your sword, unbend your bow, and give me kisses three. Although I be a loathsome worm, no harm shall I do to thee. Charlin stopped. What sort of witchcraft was this? Then the worm spoke again, but now in a familiar voice. Put up your sword, unbend your bow, and give me kisses three. If I am not one by the rising sun, one shall I never be. Now Charlin understood. He sheathed his sword. He approached the worm and kissed it once. Nothing happened. He kissed it twice. Nothing happened. He kissed it a third time and it reared up, raising to its full height, bellowing flames that came back on itself, burning its skin and scales that curled back, revealing Margaret. Trowin threw his cloak around his sister, and together with his men they went to the great hall of Bamborough Castle. When they entered, they saw the witch queen sitting on the throne all alone. She rose and put out her hand, saying, Childwin, long I have waited for your arrival. I have tested your mettle. And you have proven to be a worthy knight, worthy to sit upon your father's throne. Chalwin approached her and put out his hand to take hers. 
But before they touched, he withdrew that hand and with the other struck her with a row in one. She shrieked and shriveled, shrieked and shriveled until at their feet, staring at them with bulging eyes, was a black and loathsome toad. The throne belongs to my sister Margaret and not to the likes of you. The toad hissed horribly, hopped from the diaz, through the great hall, out the gates, into the castle gardens. Where? Till this very day you might see that black and loathsome toad. For every spell, there's a curse and a benefit. And the benefit he gave to her was everlasting life. She will always be a loathsome toad. This next story, I, oh, was a bit of fun for me. It's, uh, I believe, Scottish. And it's called Katie Crackernut. Once upon a time, there was a king and a queen, which happened a lot in the old days. But this king had a daughter named Anne. And she was so beautiful that everyone fell in love with her, whoever laid eyes upon her. And the queen had her own daughter, Katie, who was very plain. But Anne and Katie loved each other as if they were full sisters. But the queen was jealous of Anne because she was so bonny and her own daughter was so plain. She decided to destroy Anne's bonny looks. She went to the henwife and asked her for advice. The henwife said, have her come to me in the morning fasting and I will see what I can do. So the next morning, the queen said to Anne, go down to the henwife and get us some eggs. Well, Anne, being the dutiful girl that she was, started out immediately, but she passed through the castle kitchen on her way out and grabbed a crust of bread and nibbled on it on her way to the henwife's house. She got to the henwife's house and asked her if she had some eggs. The henwife said, lift the lid of that pot and we shall see. Well, Anne lifted up the lid of the pot and looked inside. Nothing happened. The henwife said, Tell your mum to keep a closer eye on her larder. I have no eggs today. Anne went home and told the queen what the henwife had said, and the queen understood. So the next morning, she said, Anne, go down to the henwife today and see if she has some eggs, and escorted her out of the castle to make sure she did not eat anything. Ah, but along the way, Anne ran across some people picking berries, and she stopped to talk with them, and they gave her a handful of berries to eat. So when she got to the henwife's house, she had broken fast. And again, the henwife said, open up the lid and see what's inside. And when she did, of course, nothing happened. And the henwife got very angry and said, tell your mom that if Pot won't boil if the fire's away. I have no eggs today. Anne related that strange story to her mother, and the queen understood. The next morning, the queen said, Anne, let us both go down to the henwife and see if she has some eggs. This time, when Anne got to the henwife's home, she was still fasting. And the henwife said, Go lift the lid of the pot and look inside, and we shall see what we shall see. This time, when Anne lifted the lid of the pot and looked inside, her head fell off of her shoulders into the pot, and out of the pot leaped a sheep's head and attached itself to her neck. The queen was satisfied. Katie was mortified. 
at what her mother had done. She wrapped Anne's head in linen to hide the sheep's head. And then that night, they stole away from the castle, never to return. They traveled for three days until they came to another kingdom. And at that castle, Katie asked if there was food and shelter for herself and her sick sister, and might there be a job she could do? She was given a position in the kitchen. And it was in the kitchen she heard this strange story. The king and queen had two sons, the eldest of which was wasting away with some strange sickness that no one could cure. Stranger still, anyone who stayed up with the prince that night, the next morning, had disappeared. The king offered a large measure of silver to anyone who could solve this mystery. Katie, brave girl that she was, volunteered. She was given a chair by the hearth of the fireplace in the prince's room where she could keep an eye on him as he slept. All went well until midnight, when the prince sat up in bed, got dressed, went down the hall, out of the castle with Katie right behind him, went to the stable, saddled his horse, called his hound, and climbed into the saddle, and Katie jumped up behind him. He did not seem to know she was there. Off they went over the fields, into the greenwood, where Katie picked nuts off the trees as they passed by, putting them into the pocket of her apron. After a time, they came to a green hill, which the prince stopped his horse in front of him and called out, Open hill, open, allow in the prince, his horse and hound. And Katie called out, And his lady behind. And suddenly there was a door that had not been there before, opening inward. In rode the prince, and as soon as he was inside, Katie jumped off the horse and hid behind the door, just as another door opened, and out came the fairies to greet the prince. And they led him into the hall where there was light and music, and they began to dance with the prince. And they danced, and they danced, and they danced, and they danced. And Katie watched as the prince collapsed to the ground, and the fairies would pick him up and set him on a couch and fan him until he came to, and then they would dance him some more. Finally, as day approached and the rooster crowed, the prince dashed out of the hall, jumped onto his horse, Katie jumped behind, and off they went, back through the greenwood, over the fields, to the stable where he unsaddled his horse, and back into the castle, up the stairs, into his bedchamber where he got his bed clothing on and laid down. The next morning, when the king came in to see how things had gone, he was pleased to see that Katie was still there and said, How did it go? It went well, she said, but I'll not stay another night unless I get a good measure of gold. The king readily agreed. Well, the next night, it was the same story. At midnight, the prince sat up, got dressed, went down the hall, down the stairs, out of the castle, into the stable, saddled his horse. Katie jumped up behind him, and off they went over the fields into the greenwood, where Katie picked nuts and put them in her pockets as they went along. Came to the green hill, and he called out, Open door, open, allow in the prince, his horse, his hound, and his lady, she called. In they went, she hid herself again as the fairies came out and took him back into the hall and they began to dance. Now, Katie had watched them dance the prince the night before and she knew what all that was about. She needed to know more. She crept into the hall and stayed in the shadows and behind other doors. After a time, she saw a little toddler fairy carrying a wand. And she heard one of the fairy women say to another, Ah, if Katie only knew. Three taps of that wand, 
and it would cure her sister Anne's head. But she cannot know and she will not know. Well, Katie looked at that little toddler and she took out one of the nuts and she rolled it across the floor to the toddler and he, he saw it and he bent down and he picked it up. She rolled another, not as far. He came over and picked it up and she rolled another and he came forward and picked it up. She kept rolling nuts and he kept picking them up until he had so many nuts he had to put down the wand in order to pick up another one. And Katie reached out and she picked up the wand and put it in her pocket. That morning when the rooster crowed and the prince ran out and she jumped up behind the horse and they went speeding back to the castle and he unsaddled the horse and went up and laid down in his bed again. She went straight to Anne's room. And with three taps of that wand, the sheep head disappeared and Anne was returned to her true form. That morning when the king came in, there was Katie, sitting by the hearth, cracking nuts and eating them. Well, said the king, how did it go tonight? Better, she said but I'll not stay another night unless I can marry the prince. Well, the king hesitated, but if the prince died, well, he agreed. That night, the prince sat up, got dressed, went down the hall, out to the stables, and away they went again across the fields into the greenwood where Katie picked some more nuts. This time, as she stole around through the hall, watching the prince being danced to death, there was that toddler fairy again, this time carrying a birdie. And Katie heard one of the fairy women say, Ah, if Katie only knew, three bites of that birdie, and the prince would be cured. Well, out came the nuts rolling across the floor, and on came that toddler, picking up the nuts, picking up the nuts, until he had so many nuts he had to set down the birdie to pick up another one. Katie reached out, picked up the birdie, and put it in her pocket. That morning when the rooster crowed and the prince dashed out of the hall, jumped onto his horse with Katie behind him, they raced back to the castle. He went back up the staircase into his bedchamber, lay down on his bed, looking as pale as death. The Katie plucked the feathers from the birdie, put it on a spit, and roasted it over the fire. Soon, the room filled with a savory odor. The prince opened his eyes and said, Oh, if I might have a, a bite of that birdie, and she gave him a bite of the birdie. He rose to his elbows and said, Oh, if I might have another bite of that birdie. And she gave him a second bite. He sat up in bed and said, Oh, if I could have a third bite of that birdie. And she gave him the rest of the birdie. And when he had finished it, he rose up hale and hearty. When the king came into the bedchamber that morning, there was Katie and the prince, sitting by the hearth, cracking nuts and eating them. Well, in the meantime, the younger brother, the young prince, had spotted Anne. And just like everyone else, he fell in love with her. So when the marriage took place, it was a double marriage. The well daughter marrying the sick prince and the sick daughter marrying the well prince. And they were happy marriages. As you might guess, they lived long and happy lives and never drank from an empty cup. And now it is time for the, the fifth and last story. Again, one of my favorites. It's called The Witch's Cloak. There was a time, it wasn't my time and it wasn't your time, but there was a time when there was a prosperous farm near the town of Clomel, 
at the foot of Mount Sleeve Lamon. It was a prosperous farm because everyone who lived there, the farmer, his wife, his children, and a few servants, worked very hard. One Samhain evening, the mistress of the house was up past midnight, carding wool, when there came a knock at the door. She called, who might be there? She heard a muffled reply. I thought maybe it was a neighbor in need and opened the door. There stood an old crone with a candle in one hand, carding combs in the other, and a horn growing from her forehead. She walked straight in, sat down on the hearth of the fireplace, putting her candle beside her, and began carding wool furiously. The mistress of the house did not know what to do, what to say. But after a time, the old woman said, Where are the other women? And with that, there was another knock at the door. Well, the mistress of the house had let evil in once. She was obliged to let evil in a second time. She opened the door, and there was an old crone with a candle in one hand, drop spindle in the other, and two horns growing from her forehead. She walked straight in, sat down by her sister, put the candle by the side, and began to spin the thread. There came a third knock at the door. There was a crone with a candle in one hand, a hand loom in the other, and three horns growing from her forehead. Soon there was a fourth knock, a fifth, a sixth. And soon there were twelve witches sitting on her hearth. The first with one horn and the last with twelve horns growing out of her forehead. All with carding combs and drop spindles and hand looms. The candles beside them threw their shadows up against the wall, all oh, was flickering. And then they began to sing an old song in Old Irish. And as they sang, the lady of the house could feel herself sinking. And when she was under their spell, they called out to her, Make us a cake! She no longer had a will of her own. She rose and went to the kitchen and got the ingredients to make a bread cake for the witches. But her eyes would not fall upon a pan to get some water. And the witches called out, Get water with a sieve! She took a sieve, left the house, went down to the spring, and tried to ladle water out of the spring with a sieve. But the water fell through. But all she could do was sit there ladling the water, letting it fall through, ladling the water, letting it fall through. Finally, the spirit of the spring took pity on her and said, Woman, line the sieve with yellow clay and then coat it with green moss. Then it will hold water. But do not give the water to the witches. They have finished the cake using the blood of your children. Rather, go to the north corner of your house and call out three times. Look to the north. The mountain of the Fenian women is ablaze as is the sky. And the witches will then leave. Go into your house, bathe the feet of your dead children in the water, and pour it on the threshold of the doorway. Bolt and lock the door. Then go to the kitchen and get the bread that the witches were making. Break it and put it into the mouths of your children. Then go and find the cloak that they were making and put it in a chest, half in and half out. Close and lock the lid. Then find yourself a dark corner to hide in and wait. This she did. 
She went to the north corner of her house and three times she called out, Look to the north, to the mountain of the Fenian women, which is ablaze as is the sky. The door of her home burst open and out came the witches screaming and leapt into the air and flew off to their home in Mount Sleeve Lamon. She went into the house. She bathed the feet of her dead children in the water, poured it on the threshold of her doorway, bolted, locked the door. Then she went and found the cake that the witches had been making in the kitchen, broke it and put it in the mouths of her children. And when she did that, color returned to their cheeks and breath to their lips. She uttered a prayer to the spirit of the spring. Then she went and found the cloak, put it in a chest, half in, half out, closed and locked the lid. Then she found a dark corner to sit in, and she waited. She didn't wait long. The witches returned screaming and howling, let us in, let us in. Door, they called, door, let us in. And the door answered, I cannot let you in. Water that has bathed the feet of innocent children has been poured over my threshold. You cannot tread here. Cake, cake, cried the witches, let us in. I cannot let you in. I am broken and put into the mouths of the children. Their blood has returned to their body. I cannot open the door. Cloak, cloak, called the witches. Let us in. I cannot let you in. I am neither here nor there. I am neither in nor out. I cannot open the door. Then the woman heard the horns of the women rattling against the window pane as they looked inside, trying to spot her. But just then, one of the candles, one of the witch's candles sitting on the hearth, guttered out. And with that, she thought she heard one of the voices disappear. And then another candle guttered out, and another voice disappeared. And another candle was snuffed. And gradually, the shouting, the screaming grew softer and further away until the last candle went out and all was quiet. When the morning began to creep into the sky, the woman rose. She picked up the combs, the drop spindles, the hand looms, and the tallow of the witch's candles and threw them all into the fireplace and watched them burn. Then she went and found the witch's cloak. She looked at it and saw that it was not quite finished. She hung it on a peg behind the door of the house in remembrance of what had happened that evening. And there it hung as the farm passed down from generation to generation for 500 years. And that's all I have to tell to you tonight. Thank you so much for joining me.